the posture of the United States in the Persian Gulf, as far as I know, and I think what they've said has not actually diminished, U.S. economic engagement remains rather robust. But more importantly, these relationships that the United States has with the Saudis and many other players in the region date back a century. These are deep relationships. The United States and these countries have long-standing relationships, and the Chinese are relatively new in this. They don't have the alliances, and they don't have these deep relationships the same way that the United States does. So how can we call this a perfect marriage if they've really just kind of met? I think it's simple that the Chinese don't have an alternative apart from Russia. And the same logic can go with the over-reliance on Russian oil, that China doesn't want to put its egg in one basket, whether that is the Gulf African suppliers or even Russia. But in the end, you can't find another partner willing to provide China with the amount of oil and gas it needs to recalibrate and restructure the economy inside China apart from the Gulf. There's no other country with the capabilities and the political will to do that apart from the Gulf and Russia. I think there is a grand strategic logic. China is becoming a great power, although with a lot of limits, and it wants to be more and more influential in international affairs, although there is a big question mark about to what extent China is influential. And so China, what is missing is partnerships or alliances. China doesn't form alliances anyway, but China needs to make friends. And if we can make a parallel with the U.S. hegemony, with U.S. grand strategy since the end of World War II, it's alliances that enables U.S. power all over the world. China doesn't have that. And I think it has found, and it continues to have, in the Gulf especially, and more broadly in the Middle East, potentially very important friends. The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa-China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City. And uh, just before we get into our show today, I want to give a huge thank you to Amit Jain and Chue Bo Shi at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore for being such gracious hosts to me last week. And all of you guys who turned out on a Friday evening after work, that is admirable to join me for what turned out to be a very lively discussion on China-Africa relations. So thank you, everybody at Amit and the NTU team in Singapore for such a wonderful, wonderful evening. Today, we're going to dive into the Persian Gulf, and we're going to head back to the Middle East. A couple of weeks ago, the China-Arab States Cooperation Forum wrapped up in Beijing. For those of you not familiar with this event, it's been going on since 2004. It took a rather long break in between 2011 and and 2023. Like other events, you know, the Chinese do this with Latin America, they also do with Africa, and they brought together leaders from Bahrain, from Tunisia, from the United Arab Emirates. In all, there were 22 delegations that attended the event, got a lot of press. I wouldn't say a lot of substance came out of it, but let's take a listen to what Chinese President Xi Jinping had to say during his keynote address. We will strengthen cooperation in key areas such as oil, gas, trade, and infrastructure. Step up fostering new growth areas such as artificial intelligence, investment, financing, and new energy and embark together on an innovative and green path to prosperity. So you heard the emphasis on energy, not surprising, in part because China now relies on the Persian Gulf for the largest share of its imported oil, nearly double what it gets from Russia. And the Persian Gulf has been one of the main reasons that the Chinese have moved out of Africa 
where they used to source about a third of their oil. Now a lot of that comes from Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, natural gas coming from Qatar and other regions and other countries in that region. Let's not forget Iran as well. The region is also becoming a major destination for Chinese investment, particularly from the private sector. Just consider this. Last year, Saudi Arabia alone attracted $16.8 billion in greenfield investment. And this year, in 2024, major Chinese brands, including BYD, Huawei, Lenovo, and countless others have announced multi-billion dollar investments in the kingdom. And also, don't forget that the kingdom was the largest recipient of Belt and Road financing last year as well. But China is also emerging as a major geopolitical player in the region. Many of you will remember back in March 2023, when then Foreign Minister Qing Gang brought together the foreign ministers from Iran and Saudi Arabia and brokered a detente between the two rivals. They had not had diplomatic relations for seven years. They brought them back. This was a key part of bringing stability back to the region, of getting these two to talk to each other and to exchange embassies and to reestablish diplomatic ties. Here we are more than a year later, and that detente is still holding. It's strained, but it's holding. And the Chinese are also trying to play a role in the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian crisis. Now, even though Israel-China relations are souring and they're going from bad to worse, in part because of China's response to October 7th. And there's really no prospect that Beijing is going to play any role in any future Israel-Palestinian settlement if that ever comes about. But the Chinese still think that they can contribute by bringing together the rival Palestinian factions. So back in April, the Chinese invited representatives from both Fatah, which is the political party that governs the West Bank, and Hamas that oversees Gaza. Now, not sure what actually came out of those talks, but just the fact that the Chinese were able to bring these two rivals together. And it kind of fosters some type of hope because if there is going to be any prospect of a two-state solution, then it's going to require some form of Palestinian reconciliation. And that's where the Chinese see that they're playing a role. And the Palestinian issue obviously resonates far beyond Israel and the occupied territories. And China has fully aligned its foreign policy with the Palestinian cause, which of course has garnered enormous goodwill with countries throughout the Arab world and the Persian Gulf. But all of this is such a new phenomenon. I mean, we wouldn't have had this show three years ago, maybe even two years ago, but the Chinese have just accelerated their diplomatic engagement with everybody in the region, and the scale of that engagement has just skyrocketed. And events seem to be moving so much faster than many of us can keep up with. So that's why it's important for us occasionally to do what we're going to do today, step back and try and figure out what's going on. There's a new book out to help us do that, A Dragon's Odyssey, China's Rise in the Gulf, and it was written by Three scholars who I'm just so thrilled to have the chance to speak today. So Ahmed Aboudwa is an associate fellow with the Chatham House Middle East and North Africa program. He also heads the China Studies Research Unit at the Emirates Policy Center in Abu Dhabi. Zeno Leone is a lecturer at the Department of Defense Studies at King's College in London. And Carlotta Rinaldo is a researcher in the China Unit at the Institute of International Studies in Verona. So glad to have you all with us. Congratulations on the new book. Thank you so much, Eric. It is very, very great to be with you. Thank you, Eric. That's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you for having us, Eric. Well, it's great to have you here. Again, congratulations on the book. The timing of this book couldn't have have been better given everything that's going on. Ahmed, let's start with you and help us understand what the motivation was to write the book. Clearly, you guys had the idea to do this kind of book long before so many of these events that we've seen over the past six, nine months have happened. And it seems to me that this is a very difficult book to write in a moment like this, when the risk of it being outdated is quite high. So how do you approach a topic like this that is changing so fast? As you said, Eric, it was a challenge. We decided to write this book way before October 7. We were working on the book in the months before that. That was before even Mahmoud Abbas's visit to Beijing, President Xi Jinping's expressing China's willingness to play a role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Everything was quiet, was 
kind of predictable. It was following President Xi Jinping's landmark visit to Saudi Arabia. So we knew or we had an idea about what are the contours of the book, the main highlights, and what are the issues we're going to focus on. But then everything turned upside down on October 7, when we had already done significant work on many chapters of the book. But then one of the reasons why this book took longer than expected was all the, the transformation at the conflict level and regional level. And of course, China's offensive that was connected directly to the conflict, whether that is against Israel or the US standing in the region, that actually delayed our work for a few months more because we needed to update all the chapters, not only one or two. Believe me, all the chapters have been updated and edited to incorporate these developments. So you were right. The risk was high of this book being outdated. But in the end, we managed to say the important things that we think China focuses on when it comes to all these very fast developments. Well, Zeno, before we get into some of the issues that China focuses on, let's talk a little bit about October 7th. How did October 7th change China's relationship with the Persian Gulf and, of course, in the Arab-Palestinian cause? First of all, let me say that, well, I don't think it has dramatically changed. I think China's posture towards the region remains constant in continuity and it is a posture that involves growing engagement for and this will continue to be like this in the long term and from my personal perspective for a very crucial reason aside from all the economic opportunities that uh, China finds in the region and that in, in the first part of the book we discuss but I think there is a grand strategic logic. China is becoming a great power, although with a lot of limits, and it wants to be more and more influential in international affairs, although there is a big question mark about to what extent China is influential. And I would like to get back to this point later on. And so China, what is missing is partnerships or alliances. China doesn't do formal alliances anyway, but China needs to make friends and if we can make a parallel with the U.S. hegemony, with U.S. grand strategy since the end of World War II, it's alliances that allow, enables U.S. power all over the world. China doesn't have that. And I think it has found, and it continues to have in the Gulf especially, and more broadly in the Middle East, potentially very important friends. I often say that the relationship with the U.S. and China is a marriage of convenience, but the relationship between China and the Gulf, for many reasons, seems a perfect marriage. So they really get along well together, and perhaps even more so after October 7. Now, this perfect marriage, and I'd like to dive into that in part because there's a lot of talk about how the United States is disengaging from the Persian Gulf, and you even mentioned this in the book as well, and that China is seeing this as an opening. But I think a lot of Americans in the State Department and in policymaking circles would strenuously disagree with that assessment, that on a security basis, the posture of the United States in the Persian Gulf, as far as I know, and I think what they've said, has not actually diminished. U.S. economic engagement remains rather robust. But more importantly, these relationships that the United States has with the Saudis and many other players in the region date back a century these are deep relationships. The United States and these countries have long-standing relationships, and the Chinese are, are relatively new in this. And as Zeno pointed out, they don't have the alliances, and they don't have these deep relationships the same way that the United States does. So how can we call this a perfect marriage if they've really just kind of met? Basically, when we say that the U.S. is engaging from the region, we also need to look at the numbers. So when we talk about the economic relations between China and the Gulf, sometimes the Taiwan want to see a bit inflated and maybe get overexcited in the sense that, yes, there is an economic engagement, is acquiring more quality, it's becoming deeper and it's there to stay. But then at the same time, when we look at the number, China will not be the most prominent actor, economic actor in the region. If we look, for example, at the Gulf Sovereign Wealth Fund, and that's a very good indicator to understand the where the money is flowing, we will still see that the biggest investors in the Gulf are Western actors. For example, I look at Adia, the Abu Dhabi 
Investment Authority. It's a sovereign wealth fund in the UAE. And if you look at that, you will see that North America is still getting 45 to 60 percent of the UAE investments. And then if we look at Europe, it is getting from 20 to 30 percent. And then if we look at emerging markets where China is located, then that's only from 10 to 20 percent. And then at the same time, if you look at the other way around, the Western world is still the biggest investor in the UAE economy. So this is just to put things into perspective. There is an economic relations that is growing. And again, this is there to stay because there are so many complementarities between these economies, as uh, Zeno was saying. But then it's a new relationship. It's in the early phase. So the Western world is still very important in this region, economically speaking. The reason why we can say that this is a perfect marriage, because they, China and the Gulf really need each other. It started as an energy trade relation, mostly based on oil and gas trade, because obviously China, after opening to the outside world, really needed hydrocarbons to expand its industrial capacity. But then today, this became more complex, more sophisticated, especially after the Belt and Road was launched, because you have China that is the region as geographically very important to expand its trade capacity. But then you also have the Gulf with its visions. Uh, the visions are these uh, five to 10 years plans through which the Gulf hopes to transition away from an oil-based economy to an economy that is more oriented toward tourism, trade, uh, technology, food security. And so it is very important when you have China coming to the region with physical, but also digital infrastructure, because if you want to expand your industry into tourism, let's say, then it's really important to have new railway lines, ports, new bridges. I'm just looking, for example, at this new high-speed train that is going from Jeddah to Mecca and Medina. And that's very important for Saudi Arabia. It was built by Chinese companies. And for Saudi Arabia, it's very important because that's significantly reducing the travel time from Jeddah to Saudi Arabia religious sites. And so that's making tourism easier. That's making tourism to the region more attractive. And that's very important for Saudi Arabia. So I agree with Zeno. This is a perfect marriage in a way, but it's a very new one. It's still in its nascent phase. And of course, when we talk about all this infrastructure, this is unlike other parts of the world where that rely on Chinese loans to build this infrastructure in the Gulf. They don't need Chinese money. So this is Chinese contractors and Chinese technology, but it's financed by each of the governments. Zeno, before we go on, and Ahmed, I want to get back to you very quickly. Again, on this perfect marriage thing, it seems like right now, yes, everything lines up perfectly in the sense that China needs energy. The Gulf has lots of energy. Europe is buying less energy because it's moving into kind of a post-fossil fuel phase, but China too wants to move into a post-carbon phase. What does the world look like in 20 years when China is moving to electrify its industry and its transportation and its economy faster than almost any other country in the world? Maybe it doesn't need that energy anymore from the Persian Gulf that it gets so much from today. What does the relationship look like down the road in this new era that China itself is pioneering? This is a very interesting question, and I think the short answer is, in my view, a lot of Chinese officials don't believe that energy transformation China is going through will mean necessarily a complete phase out of oil and gas in the trajectory of fueling the future of the Chinese economy. So by that virtue, I think Gulf countries will remain very, very important strategically for China. The second component here is the Chinese leadership, I think, still think that the possibility to move on Taiwan is there. And if that happens before this energy transformation happens, I think the Gulf countries will prove that they are very, very strategically important together with other countries like Russia, for example. So the uncertainty about the future of the geopolitics in South China Sea and the Indo-Pacific, combined with the uncertainties around the Chinese economy with the downturn now we are seeing in the property sector and unsustainable debt in the declining uh, domestic demand in China make the calculations of Chinese leadership still being focused on fueling their economy with traditional forms of energy until this insufficient renewable energy sources are up and running enough to wire the whole economy in China. Another factor is that I agree with Carlotta that Western investments are very important in the Gulf and sometimes eclipse the Chinese economic interests. But at the same time, Gulf countries 
complain sometimes that the willingness, the political and the willingness of corporations in the West sometimes is not there to fuel this transformation to the future. And here I'm talking specifically about clean energy. If you look at European companies, for example, you will see EDF, a French company, as leading this European uh, inroads into helping the Gulf economies to transform and transition. But you don't see much when it comes to the input from other EU and American companies helping these countries. On the other hand, you will see a huge focus from Chinese counterparts in expanding their operations in the Gulf and helping genuinely these governments implement their economic diversification visions, 2030, 2035, and so on. So if the West is willing more to give those countries what they want, I think we could see some shift in the focus when it comes to economic diversification. And we can use the example of AI as a, a linchpin in this comparison. We have seen the UAE shifting its cooperation and divesting from partnerships with China towards signing deals with Microsoft. And you, you guys published a very interesting piece on the AI minister in the UAE saying that our future focus will be with in partnership with the US. These are very important examples that we can use to measure partnerships between the Gulf countries versus the US, EU on one side and China on the other side in many other sectors. So I'm listening to Zeno. There's something that just confuses me here. So when you look at the top 10 suppliers of energy to China, six out of the 10 come from the Gulf. And that feels like a heavy concentration in a highly volatile security environment. And unlike Russian oil that can pass through a pipeline, oil and energy that comes from the Gulf to China has to pass through waterways that can be easily disrupted, intercepted, or blocked by the United States in the event of a conflict in Taiwan, and that if there's sanctions or they want to stress the Chinese energy supply. And the lesson coming out of Europe from the war in Ukraine was that the Europeans, particularly the Germans, relied way too heavily on Russia for their energy. It feels to me that when six out of 10 of your energy suppliers are coming from one region that can be disrupted by a rival, that feels pretty high risk. What is the security assessment, in your view, of this new reliance on Persian Gulf energy? I think it's simple. The Chinese don't have an alternative apart from Russia. And the same logic can go with the over-reliance on Russian oil, that China doesn't want to put its egg in one basket, whether that is the Gulf, African suppliers, or even Russia. But in the end, you can't find another partner willing to provide China with the amount of oil it needs and gas it needs to recalibrate and restructure the economy inside China, apart from the Gulf. There is no other country with the capabilities and the political will to do that apart from the Gulf and Russia. So I think there is a bipolarity here when it comes to energy supplies to China. And I think this is one of the major weaknesses, strategic weaknesses in the national security of China that they talked about uh, many times, the Malacca Strait issue, dilemma, and so on and so forth. At the same time, I think from the Gulf perspective, it is not only about China. The oil, as you rightly pointed out, oil and gas will continue to flow to Asia. China, obviously, is the biggest customer, as you pointed out. But in the end, in the Taiwan contingency, I don't see the U.S. blocking oil and gas imports to Asia in general. I see a recalibration of these exports from the Gulf to serve the economies of the U.S. allies, such as Australia, Japan, South Korea, and the ASEAN countries in general. Because in the peak of escalation, these economies or the dependence of these economies will also escalate on Gulf oil flows. So for the Gulf region, Asia in general is a win anyway. They have to look at Asia and they have to double down on their partnerships in Asia. This explains why these partnerships have been intensifying from the Gulf perspective, not only with China, but also focusing on these countries I mentioned before. And the last visit was Emirati President Mohammed Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed was in South Korea before he headed to 
attend the China-Arab Cooperation Forum. That tells us a lot about the focus that for them, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not US-China. It's a diversification that serves their own economic diversification and energy transition in the future. I think China indicated at the COP26 in Glasgow a couple of years ago that before they meet the targets of the global agenda on the green economy and decarbonization and climate change, we will get to 2070. So when we think about China's relationship with traditional energy consumption, so we're talking very much long term. And this is also because they will struggle to adapt their developing economy to a greener economy. So to a more modern economy, that's a challenge there. And yes, just one minor point. I think the logic of the BRI is about escaping that trap that Ahmed described. Perhaps it's challenging. It's not that easy, not that simple to organize transport of oil across the Eurasian landmass, across sovereign states as well. And it's easier to do this and cheaper as well to do this at sea. Although then with all the security challenges that Ahmed uh, described. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought up the BRI. Carlotta, can you talk us through the role that the Persian Gulf plays in the BRI? And in fact, there was just news that came out this week that Iraq is now considering joining the BRI and linking its development road initiative, which is a trade route that connects to Turkey, together with the Belt and Road. So a lot of talk about the Belt and Road in the Persian Gulf. It's increasingly an important region. Give us an overview of the lay of the land in terms of the BRI in the Persian Gulf. So the way China looks at the region in terms of the BRI, it sees the Gulf and the wider region as an entry point. It's a point of access for Chinese goods. Let's look again at the UAE. Probably, I would say it's often called a magnet for investments because it's usually one of the countries where uh, China invests the most in the Gulf. So the UAE is where most of the Chinese goods are then redistributed to the wider Middle East. And so what is the logic here of coming and build new infrastructure? China would come and build uh, a new project like the Etihad Rail for one simple reason. This is a railway line that is going from the east side of the country of the UAE to the west side of the country. And so you build this sort of infrastructure because it's easier then for you to circulate Chinese goods in the Gulf and in the wider Middle East. And then it also sees the Gulf not only as an entry point for Chinese goods like electronics and smaller components. It's also a place where it wants to sell uh, electronic vehicles. This is also part of the energy transition. So China knows that because of its overcapacity in electric vehicles, it needs some entry points like the Gulf where it can start to make its uh, vehicles more international. And the Gulf is perfect for that because that's also in the Gulf agenda to diversify. They want to increase the public use of electric vehicles by six folds in the next year. So by 2030, if I'm not mistaken. So now, for example, if you go out in Abu Dhabi, the chance that you are calling an Uber and you will see a Chinese electric vehicle showing up, pick you up, it's very likely. And so this is, again, a point of convergence uh, where you see the area, not just as an access for uh, infrastructure, physical and digital infrastructures, but also for electric vehicles and electric components. I think it's very important also to understand the recalibration that China is undertaking now when it comes to the BRI from the headline catching a huge project that dominated the BRI until 2016 to the BRI 2.0 that is focusing, as Carlotta rightly said, on digital infrastructure, on green energy, and also in debt sustainability. And this is very important because Gulf countries can fuel this expansion in China's vision for the energy transition all over the world and take its uh, right place, as Chinese scholars would like to say, in the world when it comes to tech and future energy without having to bear the risks of dead bubbles, which color the relationship between China and some poorer countries in Africa and also the Middle East. So I think the, the Gulf, in addition to its strategic location and also its trade deals, especially with big markets like the EU and the US, it also uh, provides China the opportunity to avoid any high risks uh, that these projects don't actually get the return on investment that has been planned. 
You know, you know, the points that we've just been hearing about the BRI also speak to this hierarchy of relationships that China has in the region. And I think there's a big misunderstanding oftentimes by outsiders who don't know the region where they treat all the countries the same. But clearly, when we see the levels of investment going to the Emirates and then obviously to Saudi Arabia is very different than Iran. Can you maybe map out for us what countries are more important to China and maybe ones that quite aren't? as a bigger priority for them for different reasons? Well, I think for obvious reasons, for the reasons that have been discussed so far, especially by Carlotta, it's clear that it's not surprising that the UAE and Saudi Arabia are up there in China's priorities due to uh, financial interest, economic interest. And clearly, China is a pain with having to choose. And not only in the region, China is a pain with having to choose or with taking the lead or exposing itself to a certain extent over many other international controversies and issues. But I wouldn't rule out completely, not that your question implies that, but I wouldn't rule out the importance of the relationship with Iran, not just because there is recently there was a security agreement achieved between China and, and Iran, but also because we are, the international order is transitioning towards, we call, what well, in a recent article I called the return of geopolitical blocks. And China, especially after the war in Ukraine, has lost a lot of opportunity, probably in the short term, every opportunity to be a friend with the West, especially with Europe, which for me, in my opinion, would be the big price for China in the long term. And so in this re the global realignment and redivision in uh, geopolitical blocks, clearly I Iran, from a political perspective, as opposed to the economic perspective of the UAE or Saudi Arabia, for example, Iran might play an important role, might become a, a close partner of China. But nonetheless, if you ask me what was the hierarchy Nowadays, I will certainly come, uh, Iran will come after Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the very short term. I think it's symptomatic also if you look at uh, one of the recent episodes we had in this context. So when we ask ourselves, is there a hierarchy and uh, is Iran less or more important than the UAE in Saudi Arabia? I think a small example is the fact that uh, quite recently there are some islands that are in a dispute between uh, the UAE and Iran since 1971. They are claimed by both, but at the moment they are under Iran. And you have China supporting the UAE, the UAE uh, perspective that these islands actually belong to the UAE. And so I think this is just symptomatic of the fact that when it comes to a dispute like this, although it is really true that China would prefer not to take sides, but then in this case it's supporting the UAE. And then if you look at if the intended countries, you have way more Chinese nationals living in the UAE compared to Iran. And you have higher volumes of trade with the UAE than with Iran. So when it comes to choosing or supporting one perspective over another, you see China taking the UAE south. Yeah, and we saw the tensions flare, Carlotta, as you pointed out, over this island issue just in the past couple of weeks. It also flared up a few months ago as well. There have been mounting frustrations in Iran over the fact that the huge quantities of investment that were promised under this, remember this $400 billion agreement that they signed, has not materialized in part because a lot of Chinese companies are concerned about being exposed to U.S. and European sanctions. So I, I get a sense that there's a frustration in Iran that, that the economic side of this relationship isn't working quite as they might have hoped. Ahmed, what's your take on that? I think it's a complicated relationship, as Zena Carlotta rightly pointed out. I think the main catalyst for China's approach to the Gulf is showing neutrality between Gulf countries, Arab Gulf countries and Iran. But when you dive deeper, you will see that there is a hierarchy, and that's obviously the Arab Gulf countries above Iran. But the complication comes not only when it comes to investments. You are right. If we take an example, the famous example of signing an agreement with Iran in March 2021, which is called the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, China invested only $185 million as per the economy minister. Iran that is 21 industrial projects and two mining projects and one service projects. That's very, very minimal. But at the same time, from March 2021 until now, I compiled some data that showed the total agreements between China and five Arab Gulf countries, both investment and construction contracts, hit $26 billion. So that tells you the level of disparity between China's partnership with Iran and Gulf Arab countries, which heightens 
by nature the concerns in Iran about the partnership with China in the long term, which also in turn reduces China's ability to pressure Iran to take any major decisions or to adopt shifts in its strategic posture when it comes to huge issues like the Gaza war or escalation with Israel in in the region. And here I disagree with U.S. administration's pressure on China to step in and to convince the Houthis and Iran to scale down their attacks. I don't think China has the ability to do that or the influence based on these dynamics that I, I mentioned here. Another factor actually is although on the surface Iran plays a very important role or provides China with an opportunity to pressure the U.S. position in the Gulf and the Middle East in general by adopting these revisionist policies towards American deployment of troops in the Gulf or Israeli policies and normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. I think China can't make these preferences available in public, lest antagonizing Gulf countries. At the same time, from the other side, Gulf countries understand these dynamics. And one of the interesting things I hear a lot in the Gulf is that they would like to deepen their ties with China to balance their China-Iran relationship. So keeping China as close as possible to Gulf countries, not to thwart any possibility in the future that the relationship between China and Iran would exceed this partnership they have with China. So there is a tripartite game here going on, which makes it very difficult for China to find its steps in these regional rivalries between them, which was very obvious in China taking the side of the UAE during Xi Jinping's visit to Saudi Arabia on the three islands issue. Well, I'd like to close our discussion by kind of stepping back from all the ground that we've covered in the past 40 minutes in our talk today and to reflect on what do you want people to take away from the book or what's the key message if the book doesn't fulfill that given how fast things are changing that you think people should know about and understand when it comes to the China Gulf relationship. I will draw from the, especially the part of the book that I've taken more care of, more closely. First of all, two things I would like the audience to take away from this and from the book. As we said at the start, first of all, nobody or very few people followed Middle East China Gulf relations until a few years ago. But actually, I would like to emphasize that the Gulf has been absolutely pivotal and its relationship with the U.S. has been pivotal to the international order since the end of World War II. And so I expect this relationship between the Gulf and China potentially to be pivotal to the future of the international order for the next few decades. And that's why I think this is a very, very important topic. The other point, very briefly, before ending it to Ahmed and Carlotta, I think the regional order is increasingly mirroring the changing international order, global order, which is an order that is becoming more and more multipolar with different players becoming more relevant, China, Russia, not just the United States. And also with the Gulf countries somehow playing out these strategies of multi-alignment, which are increasingly relevant to understanding how the global south is behaving, approaching this world order transition. And I'll leave it there. Yeah, as Zeno was saying, this is a relation that was mostly overlooked, I would say, in the past. And as you said before, this is probably a book that we will not have seen a few years ago. But I believe this is a relation that we need to keep in check and we need to look at for the future. Because we are talking about two major drivers of the global economy, China and the Gulf. These are very business-oriented economy, and they alone represent 22% of the global GDP. So I believe a mistake we should not make is not to look at how this uh, relation is evolving over time. And another point I would like to make, just to reinforce what I said before, this is not a relation about hydrocarbons only. It's a relation that with the time will gain more and more sophistication and more and more uh, quality in terms of green investments, in terms of AI, in terms of technology. And I also will say that we should have a look at how this relation is evolving abroad, because what we have seen recently is that you also have China and Gulf countries collaborating outside, collaborating abroad, uh, also in renewable energy. Just recently, there was a very interesting piece of news regarding joint collaboration in Uzbekistan, 
where you have Aqua Power, one of the major power developers in Saudi Arabia, developing wind power plant in Uzbekistan. And to do so, it is collaborating with Chinese companies in terms of uh, installation of turbines and the uh, construction of turbines. And then also you have the Silk Road Fund investing in Aqua Power. So they are doing this also to go abroad and start to build for themselves a more prominent role in the global south. And I think this is also very interesting. Ahmed, I'm going to give you the, the last word. I think there are a few points I would like to make here. Uh, first of all, it is very, very clear now that the, the Middle East is turning into a strategic competition arena, whether we like it or not. As Carlotta said, China's priority and the MENA country's priority in terms of the relationship with China is, is expanding their economic cooperation and technological cooperation in the long term. And they see selective compatibility in that both are going through economic restructuring of, of their national economies, and they want to make this alignment between the two processes for the benefit of both sides. But at the same time, it is now very clear that China wants to undermine the United States' strategic standing in the Middle East that has underpinned uh, regional security after since World War II and wants to do that incrementally through partnerships with Gulf countries, especially. That said, we can see in the patterns of relationship that China clearly sees its concentration of influence being in the Gulf. We saw during the China-Arab Cooperation Forum, the signing of comprehensive strategic partnership agreement with Bahrain, which left everybody bewildered. But obviously, the only explanation is China wants to concentrate its focus in the Middle East, in the Gulf. Uh, the second point is MENA countries don't see this partnership from a zero-sum game perspective. They don't see China being an alternative security provider in the region anytime soon, and they are not expected to reduce the intensity of their security partnership with the U.S. In fact, they want to increase it, and we could see that in the negotiations now between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. on a defense pact. So Middle Eastern countries are not naive when it comes to uh, understanding China's true intentions in the region, and they don't want to antagonize the United States, especially on security and high-tech spheres. The last point I wanted to make is these dynamics leave us with two camps in the region. China wanting to build a coalition of Arab and Islamic countries by siding with them on the issues they are really interested in and align with their interests, especially Gaza. And at the same time, the United States having this vision in the region built on a normalization deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel that allows us to build a new security paradigm in the region and make it more able to focus on transition in the Indo-Pacific. But China's influence has limits. And I think these limits are very obvious since October 7. It had made some inroads and successes since October 7, and even before that, since signing the deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran in March 2023. But October 7 and Gaza war showed us that the United States is still the main player in the region, and that China's influence is connected directly to U.S. actions. For example, if the United States aligns with Netanyahu's government's practices in Gaza, that would give the space for China to heighten its criticism of the United States. But since March, when there is a divergence in views between Washington and Tel Aviv, we saw a change in this space of China's ability to castigate the United States. And we could see the United States is making a comeback in the region when it comes to military, diplomatic, and normative influence as well. We saw more engagement by Secretary Blinken yesterday in the humanitarian summit. We saw dedication $400 million humanitarian aid to Gaza. And we saw, most importantly, an emphasis in Washington on ceasefire in Gaza, which marked a shift that undermined China's ability to use this to criticize the United States. So, to sum up, the United States will always be the main preferred partner for MENA countries. China comes next, but that does not mean that intensifying security partnership with the U.S., throwing the partnership with China out of the window. That's not going to happen. As Carlotta said, this is strategic. This will remain the focus of MENA countries. But as I said, selective compatibility, selective sectors that don't jeopardize their relationship and interests with the U.S. The book is A Dragon's Odyssey, China's Rise in the Gulf. Ahmed, if people want to buy it, where can they go to get it? Is it available? Yes, it is available on the website Neil and Farad. They can always order it from this 
website and there are plans now to expand on other platforms as well. Wonderful. Well, I will put a link to the book in the show notes. This is absolutely essential reading. Thank you, all three of you, for joining me today. Ahmed Aboudwa is an associate fellow with Chatham House Middle East and North Africa program. He also heads the China Studies Research Unit at the Emirates Policy Center in Abu Dhabi. Zino Leone is a lecturer at the Department of Defense Studies at King's College London. And Carlotta Ronaldo is a researcher in the China Unit at the Institute of International Studies in Verona, Italy. Carlotta, Zina, and Ahmed, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Eric, for having us. It was a pleasure. And I'll be back again next week with Cobus for another edition of the China Global South podcast. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com.